Thank you for staying with us on the AM show. And as promised, we're talking about the NDC's latest Congress. We have 10,936 delegates, 81 uh, contenders, and 14 slots available. In the end, uh, 25 in all, because you're also looking at the, the NEC members, the deputies, and all of that. But the NDC has elected its national officers to steer the affairs of uh, the party for the next four years. The team has former General Secretary Esiudun Ketia leading the pack as national chairman, former member of parliament for Ketu South, Fifi Fiavi Kwete, uh, also elected General Secretary of the party. In all, about 25 of these executives have been given the nod to wrest power from the governing NPP. Question is, can they? Today, we analyze Saturday's event and also speak to some executives as well as top NDC members. Joining us for uh, the conversation uh, this morning, we have Dr. Osai Kwapong, uh, who is here with us. He will be here helping us get into those uh, discussions. Our other guests will join us as the show proceeds. And Dr. Kwapong, of course, is a CDD fellow. A very good morning to you, Dr. Good morning to you too. It's always good to have you whenever you're in town passing through <laughs> like this. We're Thank grateful you. that you've made the time to, My pleasure. to join us. Um, so I'll start with you. First of all, the Cape Coast event. Mm -hmm. National Youth Organizer, National Women's Organizer. That was settled until we saw that injunction. And we'll get into the swearing in of Giorgio Pariado Pablo and what the court had said, the injunction. But what did you make of that initial uh, Congress? Did, did it give any taste, any signs of what we saw this past Saturday? You know, I think it, you know, you, you, you get to see that sometimes when the, you know, incumbent executives try to put their weight behind particular candidates and the sort of tensions that it can generate, particularly around the national youth organizer. I started getting worried that it was starting to degenerate uh, into you know, a personal back and forth with all the revelations. But I mean, politics is a very competitive affair. Uh, whether we are competing against our political opponents or whether we are competing amongst ourselves, it sometimes brings out uh, some, of these, some of these passions. Uh, you just hope that it doesn't cross a line because it can become injurious to the party itself. But uh, I mean, I'm glad that at least that 24, 48 hour period sort of subsided. The former president weighed in to say, you know, at the end of the day, it is the interest of the party that is as hard. Let's all seize all of these um, hostilities. And then at least I think it puts them in a much better place you know, mentally, emotionally, and all of that as they prepared for what just happened over the weekend. I personally feel, though, the, the acts that we saw in Cape Coast were very bad, mm -hmm. very ugly scenes that we saw with the firing of gunshots. Alex Sibifia clarified that those were the police actually mm -hmm. firing those gunshots. And some 16 people that mm -hmm. uh, the police is on a manhunt for with a 10,000 Ghana City bounty on each of their heads. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, everything that that escalation led to Jota Pariado after winning by the skin of his teeth, mm -hmm. you know, now going on a rampage, attacking Sam George, Sami Jemfi, yeah. among other stalwarts of the party, and even daring the top echelons of the party to come and you know speak to the issues. Uh, then, apparently, I don't know whether you saw mm -hmm. the two of them, uh, Sami Jemfi, Jota yeah. Pariado sitting with uh, you know, president. former president John Dramani Mahama. And then we were told they had smoked the peace pipe. Yeah. They wouldn't say anything online and all of that. Of course, you can tell that the, the tensions mm -hmm. are still simmering. Right. But on the back of that, I mean, the happenings on the day, did you expect to see that? Especially for a party, we criticized the MPP when they had their own violence mm -hmm. and claims of mm -hmm. rigging and all of that. Were you expecting the party supposedly in waiting, the NDC, to deliver scenes like, like this one. Was, was that what you were expecting, what happened in Cape Coast? You know, I, there's just something about political opposition, and I just don't know why these uh, intra-party elections tend to get you know, that intense to the point where it comes across as though we are forgetting who, quote-unquote, our real political opponents are. 
right? We fight so intensely among ourselves that you would think the election is between us and our fellow party members. So it's, it's rather unfortunate when it sort of plays out like that. But I think part of the reason too is that, and one of the things that I have suggested is that perhaps those who are already in office, the incumbents, the party establishment figures should perhaps begin to play a more quote-unquote neutral role publicly where these elections are concerned. Because when it, you start to perceive that you know, a particular national office or office holder is putting his or her weight behind a particular candidate, it makes it look like the race is tilted you know, and it's, the proceedings may not be fair, things like that. So I think one of the things, one of the lessons for me is how do you make sure that there's a certain sense of neutrality from current incumbents or the establishment party leaders going into some of these intra-party elections? Mm. And we also know that from there, definitely, we headed to the big one, yeah. what we saw on Saturday. What would be your assessment of what transpired? Some say because of the scenes in Cape Coast, this was pretty mellow. I had Kokua and you know who in the studio here with me on Saturday saying that, well, because of the scenes from Cape Coast, this was a lot more restrained, not the usual vibrance, vibrancy, if you like, that you would see on the grounds and all of that. But in the end, I guess bottom line is they wanted a, a successful Congress and a peaceful one. What, what would be your assessment? Exactly. They wanted a successful conference. They wanted a peaceful conference. I'm sure because of what had happened in Cape Coast, there was some expectation that even if you know, the National Youth Organizer election, for example, can cause all of this angst, then how much more the national executives want, particularly too, because when there had been you know, issues in the public spaces for the national chairman race between uh, Mr. C. Dunkete and uh, Mr. Fuswan Pofo. So I think part of that was also the expectation that is this even a bigger sign of things to come? Mm. Um, and for me, I'm glad that it wasn't a sign of bigger things to come in terms of even worse behavior than had been witnessed in Cape Coast. So for me, we should commend and appreciate the fact that it was, you know, it was peaceful, everything went smoothly, and at the end of the day, they had a successful Congress. So for you, at the second calling, the NDC scaled that hurdle yes. at the Congress. Yes, because I think it wouldn't, it, it, would have, it would have perpetrated the narrative from the weekend that, you know, they weren't organized, they couldn't control their own people. Imagine if this had also not gone well at the back of what had happened in Cape Coast. I think it wouldn't have been um, a good public relations thing for their party. So I'm glad they were able to pull through it. I, I, I actually recall, I think it was the MPP um, delivering its solidarity message. You know, mm -hmm. if you recall, the NBC went to the MPP's own Congress and mm -hmm. jabbed them and they, they returned the favor. Right. And one of the things they mentioned was that, well, you people have said yourselves that when it comes to uh, violence, you, you seem to know how to do it, so we are not surprised. So I guess if anything had happened there, exactly. it would have just reinforced and yeah, right. reinforced right. that narrative. Right. Yeah. Interesting thoughts uh, you've had there. Mm -hmm. Let me also mention that we have uh, Dr. Bernard Tutu Wahin, lecturer, political marketing consultant at the University of Education, uh, Winneba. Doc, thank you for joining the conversation. And we also have via Zoom, Dr. Kwame Asa Asante, political scientist, head of the Center for European Studies at the University of Ghana. Doc, good morning to you. Good morning to you and good morning to my friends in the studio. All right. Dr. Wahin, uh, just hold for me since he is on Zoom and that anything could happen there. Let me quickly engage uh, Dr. Kwame Asasanti. For you, your assessment, I know you were here on Saturday sharing your thoughts, but your assessment, yeah. Congress 1 and Congress 2, Cape Coast and Accra. Uh, what did you see in Cape Coast what were the lessons learned that maybe the NDC brought to bear in Accra? And what would be your assessment of what we saw last Saturday? If we look at what happened in Cape Coast, part of it was a sorry story. The chaos that greeted the whole beautiful exercise almost mad it. And then uh, the, the violence and all that. A completely different scenario in Accra where it was peaceful and more calm. But you can understand what happened in Accra from the perspective of Cape Coast. 
in a sense that uh, they wanted to avert the situation where there will be a repeat of that ugly spectacle in Cape Coast. Uh, so they put in their all, and with the support of the security, they were able to maintain some high level of, of uh, discipline, and then the election went on smoothly, and they had their leaders elected. Uh, the lessons learned so far is that if you are uh, the leaders, in a time they are going for election, if they're able to do their homework very well, which I commend Mr. Sibifia and his team, uh, they are able to get the results that they want. And uh, those of us who are students of democracy, we are happy because no democracy thrives without peaceful atmosphere. You need to create that enabling environment that brings about peace so that people can go and exercise their franchise freely. And uh, uh, that's one lesson. Another lesson is that organization decides everything. You see how they organize themselves against what happened in Cape Coast and work for them. So I will urge all political parties that any time they go into any contest, the organization must be paramount, and then there must be the conscious effort to ensure that there is peace, so that whatever exercise that they are ruling, at the end of the day, we get to its logical conclusion without any incident. Uh, what for you were the standout occurrences or highlights of what happened at the Accra Sports Stadium? For me, uh, reminiscent of what we saw, Kodia uh, Frimpong, now uh, the, the, the chairman of the MPP, and when John Buedu, you know, I mean the general secretary of the MPP, when John Buedu uh, came through and, and the sort of uh, reaction, and then when JFK came through and the the change sign and everything uh, that happened and how it panned out. Similar scenes when John Sidney and Ketia uh, hit the ground and the, the sign of change and all of that. And again, the acceptance, for example, from Dr. Peter Boama Otokuno when he was seen to be in pole position, yet Fifi Fiavi Fete trouncing him and his quick admittance that, look, I've lost, let's forge ahead with the party. For you, what were the standout events? Uh, if you look at, uh, I must say that uh, during the, the voting, even before the voting and all that, and during the voting, the early stages, I was not around, uh, but uh, I monitor a few from the television set and also listen uh, to the radio. But all in all, what I saw was that, um, you know, there was the desire, the burning desire of the people to comport themselves and then to make sure that whoever emerges victoriously, the person will be, you know, congratulated. And then whoever loses the election, you are sub defeat and abide by the rules of the game. And that played out. You saw quickly uh, Otokuno calling uh, Fifi to congratulate him and accept defeat and all that. That's a spirit behind any democratic experiment or exercise that when you lose the election, you must be magnanimous enough to be able to uh, accept defeat and abide by the rules of the game. Um, we saw that. We also saw uh, the, the, the desire, the burning desire of the people to make sure that at the end of the day, it is not about their party, but it's about the Ghana that they want to, as it, uh, quote unquote, to wrestle power from and then redeem or uh, redeem the people from the, 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 the shackles and tentacles of bad rule. That, let me put it that way. Um, for them. So uh, there was every effort towards uh, achieving this objective, and that really uh, worked out beautifully. Uh, it is true that we saw aspect of the campaign which was, uh, was getting nasty and all that, but at the end of the day, uh, you, you hear from Council of Elders and then well-meaning people within the party preaching peace and making sure that the party's interest uh, must be considered as paramount, and that really worked the magic for them. Let me come into the studio now. Uh, Dr. Boahin has been waiting with bated breath uh, to also contribute to the show. Thank you so much, Doc, for your patience. Yes, yeah. uh, l let's start with your takeaways from the two events, Cape Coast and Accra, but with a focus on Accra, uh, the, the, the Accra Sports Stadium Congress, and how things panned out. What for you stood out? So, um, good morning to you and uh, my colleagues, um, and good morning to viewers. Um, I think that um, it has been a great learning experience, you know, coming from a background 
um, where people thought you couldn't do it, where people have branded you, you know, in the negative, and then you hit um, a second level with a whole different kind of brand. I think that we can say um, kudos to uh, the executives of um, NDC and the organizers of you know, the Saturday's um, program. And um, as um, Dr. Sian Radley put it, you know, uh, several factors you know, contributed to you know, the successful um, organization of the um, um, uh, Saturday's event. And I think that, you know, one thing that for me as, as, as a, a lecturer in marketing and management believes in is, is a learning organization. Normally, we serve people. And so when people are complaining and probably giving you suggestions, you know, you take it from that perspective and you reshape or repackage yourself and deliver. Um, to me, that makes you more of um, customer oriented, you know, um, organization than probably believing in your ideology, probably believing in your stand, you know, uh, moving forward. And you see from a political marketing sense, what we have seen, you know, with various studies and um, research, we believe that, you know, um, politics is taking up a management perspective. And so if you are able to manage your internal politics very well, it translates into victory with the external politics. And so that is what, you know, has become the order of the day and the focus of research, you know, in, in political marketing. And I think that the state that we find ourselves, you know, um, as, as um, a growing democracy, we need to learn from some of these experiences. It is about what the voter sees. It is about what the voter needs. It is about what the voter is looking for. You know, the kind of perception that the voter holds about you, your leadership, your activities, your ideologies, you know, mm -hmm. is what matters. Because that becomes the point of attraction, you know, for the voter to say that, fine, what I'm looking for resides in this political party, and therefore I would go for it, all right? So um, I think that the NDC has come that long way. Um, they didn't, you know, um, stayed in, in the Cape Coast event. Um, they listened to the comments that were coming and decided to put their best foot forward. You know, so that readiness is what we saw on Saturday. And to me, it is, it is an achievement. And you see, I want to um, agree with Honorable Idrisu and the statement that he gave on Saturday, um, saying that you know, the leadership of the NDC should brand and rebrand. Right. That is a very... You mean Harry Idrisu? Yes, Harry Idrisu, yes, yeah. You know, that is a huge advice, you know, to, 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 to the party. And I am believing that if the party will listen to him and put expert knowledge together, you know, to understand what it takes to brand and rebrand NDC going into 2024, then that would, 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 would sort of bring some kind of... Um, 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 successes, you know, to, 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 to the party. Mm. From a marketing perspective, especially as we are talking about saleability, as you started, yeah. you know, w would it have been fatal, catastrophic, catastrophic, I should say, for the NDC if they had repeated the scenes of Cape Coast in Accra, if there had been some violence, if there had been some, would it have been fatal for the NDC? Yes, um, it all depends on you know, what the voters are looking for, mm. all right? You see, uh, voters in general cannot be predicted. And you see, when it comes to our body politics in Ghana, you know, the political science um, perspective and the political marketing perspective, we all believe that um, voters are changing and they are strictly not predictable, right? So um, if you check, we have two different cohorts of voters in Ghana now. I mean, the core partisan voters, and then who will so, always vote exactly <laughs> along certain always, lines. Yes. Right. So for them, you can't change. Okay. All right. 
But the most interesting thing is that um, you realize that the swing voters who are actually the kingmakers, who decides whether uh, victory will go in the way of NDC or MPP, you know, um, they are the kingmakers and they decide whether NDC will be victorious or NPP will be victorious. And these guys have certain things that they look for. And if you check, if you check, the share of NDC and the share of MPP have all reduced, okay, coming from 2016 to 2020. Core partisanship has reduced, all right? Mm -hmm. So if you are saying that you are organizing an election today for NDC party members and MPP party members to vote, the 50 plus, plus one would be very, very uh, impossible for the two parties to achieve. And you're sourcing data, surveys that have been conducted. Exactly. Th those yes. are the ones. Yes. Are these ones that you have, you know, personally conducted or you're sourcing general data? This, this, this is a general data which gives you the calculations. Okay. All right. Yeah. Now, the key thing or the key cohort that decides uh, are the swing voters. And you see, for a long time, their population keep increasing, especially among the youth. All right, who commands a higher percentage of Ghana's population? All right, they, 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 there seems to be that demographic shift, you know, and they are all converging at the center. Mm. So, the issue of center right, center left, that is what it means. Mm. All right, now, which means that when these people decide, then you have victory. If they go against you, you are, you, you are losing. Right. All right. So it means that your, your, your brand values, part of it, or majority of it, should be targeting at them. Mm. All right. Because whether you like it or not, <laughs> your followers will vote for you. Right. Your sympathizers will vote for you. Okay. Your core partisans, uh, party members will vote for you. The worst of it is that they will abstain. All right. But the key point remains that if you want to attract all your, your communications, your activities, and, and all your marketing you know, deliberations, um, part of it is focusing on the core, uh, sorry, the swing voters or floating voters, then of course you have advantage. Right. All right. But you see that over the years, both NDC and MPP, even 2016 and 2020, most of their communications and activities are directed at core party members, mm. which is not good. It's like preaching to the choir. Exactly. And, and that's like pouring water on stone because exactly. these are fanatics anyway. Yeah. These are your members. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting twist because... Yeah, so, it, so, so you see that any church that refuses to do evangelism, that church doesn't grow. Interesting perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, according to data, mm -hmm. generally, it, it's projected that the youth on the African continent by 2050 would be over 50, 60 percent. Mm -hmm. you, you get it. So that resonates with what he's saying. And in Ghana, I mean, we are following that very same, you mm -hmm. know, um, trend. If you look at our 2021 census and all of that, which means that these parties, from what Dr. Tutubuahin is saying, would have to also target the youth, the very young people who may be impressionable, but who are also becoming very discerning. But I'd like to find out from you, is the NDC now, maybe just to wrap on that point, mm -hmm. is the NDC now more united, even with the cracks that emerged before this, this Congress? Is it more united, more divided? Is it a stronger force now? Is it a weaker force on the back of the two Congresses that we, we saw? Um. It's, I mean, it's very difficult to, quote-unquote, judge, but at least on the back of Cape Coast and then now on the back of the success of Accra, I would hope that post these two major um, election events that they are going to forge ahead, given the messages that are coming out from party leadership, you know, those who won, those who didn't win, that they really, there's a, there's a strong recognition that they don't have a choice but to go into this um, united. Yes, every so often, post-election tensions might simmer on. But I always say that 
for political parties, the key is always how you manage these post-election issues, right? If you are able to manage it well where they don't continue to fester and they don't continue to become issues, it puts you in a much stronger position. Has the NDC successfully done that? Well, they just finished, right? I mean, today is Monday, it's just Saturday, right? So I think from now till, you know, as they get themselves ready for 2024, their inactions or their actions and inactions will be very, very important in ensuring that, you know, tensions don't simmer, the issues don't persist, that they will be able to present a united, because they need that. You can't afford... Right. The luxury of having cracks in your party. The MPP wants to break the eight. Precisely. And they also want to seize power. And so they if also, you are not united, obviously. Exactly. <laughs> and then you are also coming at the back of this eight year cycle thing. Mm. You have an incumbent government that is really vulnerable right. at the same time to some of the economic challenges that the country has faced, right? So if you look at the nature of the political winds blowing, if you are the NDC, you want to make sure that you are united to the point where you can take full advantage. Yes, two years is a long time in politics, but you don't want internal frictions to be the reason why you can't seize the moment, right? You know, and prevent the breaking of the eight, and you know, be able to vote out, you know, the incumbent party. So they don't have a choice but to make sure that the issues don't persist. All right, uh, Dr. Wami Asante, on, on the issue of unity, we saw that tape uh, now we don't call it a leaked tape anymore because apparently he had spoken about that matter but the tape of Asiadun Ketia, the infamous one uh, come out people asked me some panelists here in the studio and others you know what I felt would happen especially with the chairmanship race and I told them from what I saw as a student of politics I felt General Mosquito would would come through and and that exactly happened I just didn't think he would you know have such a margin is, is the NDC more united now, even after the challenges they, they faced and with the new face of their leadership? Uh, it's early days yet. Uh, why am I saying that? Because uh, when you go through election, there are three phases. The pre-election phase, we saw the rancor, the bickering, the jostling and the noise, you know, uh, that who were around the whole process. Then on the election phase, on the day of election, there was calm and all that. People expressed themselves through the voting and all that. Then the post-election phase, all right, this is where if there is any trouble, it's going to uh, fester. And uh, as of now, we haven't seen that yet. Uh, it's also, and if you listen to the, the leaders, especially General Mosquito and then uh, Fifi and Co, they are prepared to, you know, as it were, trigger that process that will ensure that any pain will be assuaged. Any problem that uh, the, the election brought to the fore will be dealt with. So it tells you how prepared they are and then uh, going to put themselves together and fight the battle of 2024. Uh, this dovetails into the uh, campaign and how they, they manage them. You look at all of them, particularly at the general uh, secretary uh, position and then the chairmanship position uh, were things that were very clear, all right, in terms of their messaging. And the message was that, look, they all preach about peace and unity because they needed that to be able to galvanize support and fight the battle of 2024, all right. That aside, there are things that really work for uh, them and undermine the fortunes of others. I'll touch on a few because um, my colleagues are also around. If you look at uh, in terms of strategy wise all right uh, the issue of the tape came in all right it was whether intended or not intended but i know as a student of polka communication and polka science i know that uh, it was a part of the strategy to throw the tape out which of course today it is not a story or uh, something that somebody cook it a student katia himself has admitted to the content and all that uh, if you look at the effect that the tape brought to bear on the issue, was that there were some people who were really in the 2020 to undermine the whole process, all right, and that uh, know them and then take a decision on them, all right. Yes, that really, really, really worked the magic for somebody like a Sidon Ketia. It did so. And also, 
uh, had a positive effect on fifth equator because if you look at uh, that type of strategy all right it tells you that yes whilst you fight for a common goal of what wrestling power that there were people who were not ready to help us this has you know historical antecedent if you look at the 1951 election uh nkrumah was accused and nkrumah said cpp people churn out a certain propaganda uh issue that yes nkrumah sorry dankwa and his people have gone to take bribe to delay independence which obviously was not the case it dankwa did all he could and this never worked the people who were voting uh, made sure that they would punish him and all that and you saw that the tape really worked the magic if you listen to the bits and pieces about, uh, you know, uh, the speech of Fifi uh, Kwete and all that, they all talk, and they say, they, get here, they talk about what, uh, you know, people with integrity to lead the party because they can afford another loss in 2024, all right? Another strategy that really also came in was the use of the media by Ezeed Nketia. He was out there, moving from media house to the other, go and express himself about his views his ideas and all that and that also worked the magic the magic uh tied it up with what uh fifi Kwete and all that they were virtually like speaking the same language you realize that the last election caused a lot of pain to them all right so they decided that um whether by design or by accident that they'll go back to their roots so you had words like probity accountability and all that these were uh, some of the statements that really uh, governing support for Rawlings from 79, 81 up to the third, uh, sorry, the fourth republic, which found expression in the preamble of the country's constitution. If you look there, you come across these words, probity, accountability, transparency, and all that. Once you churn this thing out during campaign, obviously, the party elements who are in tune with the ideals, the tradition of the party get excited. They know that the time has come for them to lift up their game and all that. They were able to do that. Fifi Kwete did that. Uh, Sir Nketiah did a lot of that. Remember, Sir Nketiah also told us that they are going to build a system, a party, a uh, political system that is fearless, that is bold, dedicated to make sure that uh, they win their lost glory. Uh, glory. That was also some of the things that really did the magic for them. And above all, the issue of what rule of law, all right, was brought to the fore. The eight people who were killed during the election, they brought it. Let us remember that one of the variables that really influenced voter choices in this country, and it's about the third one, is the issue of a rule of law. Mm -hmm. Ghanaians want leaders who abide by the rule of law and then to guide the conduct during uh, election or within any uh, democratic space. I remember, I see Rick and Tia also talk about what the issue to what deal with the economy. It is the economy is the first most important uh, uh, factor that influences voter choices in this country. Take it or leave it. Whether you are NDC, MPP, you want a sound economy to be able to survive. And I see you doing your touch on that. Obviously, though we are doing intra-election, you know, uh, thing. Uh, that, let us remember that at the end of the day, these things would dovetail into the national election and work the magic for him and then uh, the, the 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 rest of his team. Uh, there were also uh, specific issues which also uh, were brought on board that really changed the dynamics, all right? Accusations and then counter accusations. For instance, there was accusation that uh, some of the people compromised themselves during the last election and they cited Mr. Fushan Pofu, Mr. Free uh, Ankara and all that. Even though, I mean, this thing, they did not, people did not come out to prove uh, that it was the case or not. But the response that we got from these gentlemen uh, did not, you know, uh, influence the choices of the voters positively because uh, the, the explanation was not that convincing and all that. Um, to say the least, uh, we had very little about in terms of rebuttals from this. And remember, in elections, uh, take it or leave it, people rely on rumor and all that. And that can sway voters to one direction or another. And that really also uh, affected those who lost, uh, particularly Mr. Mbofu and uh, Mr. Uh, Evisefriye Ankara. There were also another uh, issue that also came to play an important role in the campaign and the elections of uh, uh, people who were campaigning for uh, Ofusian Mbofu, for instance, were said to have been 
quote unquote enemies of uh, the, the the system hmm. all right they were any people who have been sacked from the parties or suspended or at best they were in mpp and all that so it was very interesting to note that hey uh, this is a gentleman who is contesting for election and people who are rooting for him are people who are not within the party and from outside the party these things are very very interesting for any observer in politics to take note and take political note of that so these things also uh, went a long way to shape that is uh, the, the 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 political choices of the voters because if you really care for your party why would you want people uh to so who, who support you to come from your main opponent and all that and you saw a lot of them whether it was a strategy or not if it was then it was a wrong one because um i was expecting mr ampofo and his team to look at that critically and begin to work against it all right there was also the initial problem which i found with mr ampof where uh, i i know that it was nothing but a, a propaganda the bandwagon effect you know the statement that yes we have prevailed upon Ketia to step down even uh, the the former president also prevailed upon him he, he did not budge and all that all right this is a bandwagon effect they wanted to apply but it never worked because what they are saying by extension is that, look, the right-thinking people are here. The cadres, uh, the uh, other members of the party, and whatnot, even opposition, they are saying that, look, the man should have stepped down. But I found it very strange because you are going for election, you put yourself up for competition, and somebody emerges to compete with you, and you begin to, what, drag your feet and all that, you are not comfortable. It, it emboldens the person uh, to come forward and confront you head on knowing that look you don't have what it takes to stand for election and others so initially i started sending signal that hey this is a wrong path to take if it's a strategy it's a wrong one but those who i'm sure who manage this campaign did not take a note of this because in political communication and in election in general when you are developing messages or you are you know in message development you are thinking about what open-ended message is always subject to attack all right so when you open yourself up like that any attack that will come, you will not be able to defend. And that right. is why when we are developing message, you look at what others will say against whatever you have churned out, any strategy and all that, in order to what, defend them. The last one I will say is that uh, we saw the issue of what? We're saying that election hinges on two things, referendum of your work and what? Contest of ideas. We saw the two at play, referendum of the work. Even though Fifi Kwete has worked for a very long time, uh, some people might have forgotten the good things he did for the party and all that. But look, these things are there. They remain indelible in the minds of people. People went for it. These are people who are, you know, clean, who are dedicated, uh, who are uh, fearless. And remember that this group that they've put up, all right, is a group that you can say without fear of contradiction that uh, they are fearless, they are bold, and they are prepared to what? Take power from the MPP. So that also... Uh, showed positively for Fifi and the same for what? Uh, 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 sorry, General Mosquito. That mm. they thought that the, over the years, the 17 years, he has served his party and served his party well. And this is a time to pay him uh, in, in, in a very positive light. And mm. that he's honest and he's bold and he's prepared to what, go all in and support his party and all that. So, all in all, uh, you can say that it was a careful effort to plan the activities develop message strategies and all that those who lost unfortunately uh you realize that even though they have very good track record look at somebody like uh, uh free ankara and all that uh yes he has seen it all as what uh somebody who contested for parliamentary seat and lost he became a deputy minister minister he has a work within the party's echelons and all that he had really paid his dues and all that but the issue about the accusation and the, 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 the wrong perception people had about him with regard to the last election, right. the two gentlemen of Ushan Pofu and the uh, Free Ankara were not able to uh, dismiss this thing and bring to light that uh, they, were, uh, not guilty, uh, they were not guilty of those offences and then they allow it to fester and that caused the pain to them. That, that, that I believe caused, that people right. will learn from this then going forward whenever an issue comes up, all right, you defend or you rebut it with all your might and with all your will. Mm. Let, let me bring in uh, other guests in the studio. So Doc has spoken about service and ideas. Uh, Fifi Quete, for example, 
talks about how since 1992, even in school, mm -hmm. he had been, uh, you know, a major figure. When people shied away from politics, he was, you know, he showed face, so to speak, mm -hmm. for the NDC. Till now, he's been minister, he's done, he's been there, done that. First time he's coming into the leadership of the party at this level, though. And for some, it was a bit surprising uh, to see him do it. But he came and he did it in style, basically. Ousting Dr. Peter Bwomo Otokuno, who was Deputy General Secretary, thinking he could go a step further, become the Substantive General Secretary. And like he mentioned, Elvis Ifriye Ankara as well. But looking at these contenders, as we start to pick them apart, definitely not all of them. When you look at the list of 25, you have NEC members and other deputies. Some of them were pretty clear. Dr. Hanabisu and others, it was clear that probably they would need an old dog, one who had been there, done that, organized, but with some of those positions. So I ask, was it then the messages of the likes of Esiedun Ketia, Fifi Kwete, among a few others, Joseph Yamin, for example, that won them the slots? Uh, you recall on the day, the chairman then, Ufoswampofu said, the mosquito, you can see, cannot bite. But on social media, after the voting, people said, well, <laughs> the mosquito has bitten him and he has caught political malaria. Uh, from the marketing perspective, is it the messages of these uh, winners that did the trick for them? Uh, so, um, you see, the first thing remains that you don't go to um, a political contest with one weapon you know, multiples of them, right? Now, when you check the messaging of um, S.E. Dunketia, you know, which um, was captured in the leak tape, um, as it were, you see, it was not just about, you know, putting up a message against the opponent. He actually tagged it as a response, all right? Now, in that tape, when you listen to it and analyze it carefully, there's what you refer to in, in politics and in political marketing as clientelism. Okay. Okay. And we talks about, you know, how you can convince people either through gifting or even through messaging. And in messaging, you see, people think about um, uh, propaganda as one of the issues in, in, in clientelism. But you see, the point remains that if you are using propaganda, it has to do with the kind of propaganda strategy you are using. And from where I sit, it was an issue of red herring, where, you see, he picked um, a message which the people no, are ready to hear. My sincere apologies for doing this. Uh, I apologize. But... We've got one of our guests, one of the contenders for deputy, who is now Deputy General Secretary. We don't want to lose her on the line. So let's, let's quickly uh, get her. Barbara Sewa Asamwa contended and was uh, retained Deputy General Secretary. Barbara, a very good morning to you. Good morning. Oh, I, I, I love the sound of your voice this morning. Is it the win? Is it the victory that has made you sound so uh, excited? happy this this morning <laughs> well my strength is in the lord so i'm always excited <laughs> wow uh, tell me we, we've been speaking about messages here for example ideas service the message tell us a bit about what you you feel led to your getting the mandate of of the people we we know the deputy uh, general secretary for example uh, dr otokuno didn't make it but but you did what did the trick Thank you very much. Your line is a bit strange. I can't hear you very well, but I hope that um, um, if you could make it a bit louder. Okay. Is it better now? Can you hear me yes. now? Yes, it's better now. Okay. I'm asking, there are others who contended but did not make it, like the, the former Deputy General Secretary, Dr. Otokuno. And I'm trying to find out, what do you feel did the trick for you? Thank you very much. Um, First of all, I take this opportunity to um, thank NDC Park for the very um, successful organization of our Congress. And to say that 
we some of us have worked for the party over the years, and we have dedicated our time and everything working for this party. Party people have seen our commitment and loyalty, and they believe that whatever work they give to us, we are able to discharge it. And so it's no surprise that um, I have been able to win again, especially when I contested for the same position that uh, I, I was occupying. And if you look at those who contested me, you realize that I was the only person who has um, the national experience as, uh, as the incumbent deputy general secretary because my colleague Peter moved up to contest for the main uh, general secretary. And so most of the, the delegates believe that with the experience and the institutional memory that I had and the work that I had done for the party in the past four years, it was very necessary that I remain in that office so that whoever became the general secretary, I will be there to give that person the necessary support. And also whoever became the other uh, deputy general secretary could also learn from me since that person will be coming uh, to the office for the first time. And I think that that is what worked for me largely and also because of my dedication and commitment to the party. Are you then happy with the number of votes you secured? Very, very happy. Because even though last four years I, I, I was I was the first deputy, you can see that I have increased my vote by all, almost 800. It's very exciting because it is not always that you get it like that. If people have confidence in you and the confidence builds up, it gives you the energy to keep working hard because you know that what you are doing has been appreciated. I'm very, very grateful for that and very excited about it. When you look at the other appointees or elected people together with you, uh, what, what picture does it create? Does it, does it paint the picture of readiness to wrest power from the MPP come 2024? You remember that the MPP in delivering its solidarity message said that, you know what, regardless of what happened on Saturday, they were going to trounce you in 2024. Do you feel the crop of leadership you have now is going to make the cut to prevent the MPP from breaking the eight? You know, all those of us who contested, we had a message, and we sent our message around the 276 constituencies to send our message to the delegates. They listened to our messages, and every NDC member, what they wanted was victory. And once they have carefully selected us to leave the party, I believe that they themselves are very confident in our ability to lead the party to victory. And I can see that this is a team that can really, really make the difference and bring us the victory that we are looking for. If you look at the, the caliber of people who have won as national executives, none of them is a, a new person. Our, our national chairman now has been the general secretary for the past 17 years. He is now the national chairman. He has all the experience that he needs to run that office. Honorable Fifi Kweche, who is the general secretary now, has been the propaganda secretary, and it was during his time that we won the 2020, uh, 2208 election. I'm sure Daniel uh, still remember the setting the record straight. Uh, that happened at that time. If you look at the national organizer, uh, Honorable Yamin, he has also been a veteran in this game. And so I the, the youth organizer has been retained, the woman organizer has been retained, the communication officer uh, was lucky enough to go on the post. And so I believe that the delegates have selected very, very effective and efficient uh, group of national executives who have already, who are already had the experience to be able to carry on with the work that we are supposed to do. And so I believe that whatever happens, we are coming to uh, power 2024, especially when the government itself uh, has really, really disappointed Daniel. Uh, before I find out what personally you would be bringing to bear when it comes to the position you've been elected to and what we can expect from the party. I, I just want to find out from you, the chairmanship position, two giants uh, came to the fight. The grass suffered, but one of those elephants won. John uh, What What do you make of that contest and what happened? Your old well, chairman is me, gone and Johnson is now the chairman. Well, if you ask me, I would say that, like you said, there are two 
people who are very experienced politicians, both had their strengths and uh, leading the party. One was the very calm, and uh, I mean, you know, it had a very calm demeanor. The other one is firebrand. And so if party people believe that at the point where we find ourselves, it is a firebrand that we need to lead the party. I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's well accepted, but I don't think that uh, the other person lost because he didn't perform. Everybody knows that he, he played his role very well. He led the party very, very effectively. However, if the delegates believe that at this point in time, we rather need a very vibrant, firebrand person to lead the party uh, into 2024 elections, so be it. And we, have, we are also all going to give in the necessary support, the support that we gave to the, the Afghan national chairman for him to succeed. We are going to give the new chairman the same support. Just that is a, the difference is their leadership style. And that is what I believe. But both of them are very strong people, and I know that they'll be able to do their work. Uh, finally, before you take leave of us, what can we expect from you and your role? What can we expect from the NDC moving forward? The cracks have shown, I mean, from Cape Coast, what can we expect by way of unity, by way of, you know, leading Ghana in future? That is what you are positioning yourselves for. In every election, there will be cracks. But after the election, definitely efforts will be made to make sure that bridges uh, develop. We, we straighten up and then cut our differences and move on. I believe that the national, the our born national chairman, what a unifier, and that is one thing that anybody cannot take away from him. And so if today he is the one who is out, I know that whatever it takes for him to come back on board, whatever we will be giving to him, he will play. The, the same applies to all the others who should not make it. I believe that whatever we will is assigned to them, they will all come uh, on board, and then we will have a very strong uh, front to go for the task ahead. NDC is a party that no matter what happens, we are able to come back together. And I believe this time will not be different, especially if you look at the people who are involved themselves, who are peace loving and right. in themselves unifiers. It will not be too difficult for us to come together. Barbara Sewa Asamwa is Deputy General Secretary of the NDC. Thank you so much for your time. And she joined us for that conversation. Interesting thoughts. You were midstream and I cut you. So it's only fair that I come back to you. And when you're done, all of us will contemplate the new crop of executives of the party and what we see that they could deliver moving forward. But back to you. All right. So I was talking about the fact that, you know, um, when we look at the messaging that um, the elected chairman put up, it was an issue of trying to let his followers, the delegates, know that, you know, um, the accusations leveled against him, i.e. that he went into the um, petition, you know, without um, 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 evidence, you know, um, was a fallacy and something that they cannot use against him. So um, he decided to throw, you know, the fact as it is into the public domain. Um, but one thing that I'm happy about the messaging of all the um, competitors was the fact that, you know, unlike previous elections where insults and um, blames and other things, you know, characterize such elections, um, we couldn't see, you know, in this um, NDC, you know, um, national executive election. And I think that it is one good thing that we cannot take away from them. And you see, I'm happy because um, I believe in internal politics. I believe in internal campaigns. But sometimes issues of appropriation becomes very important. You know, when you level an allegation against your own colleague and it turns out that that person wins, you know, then, of course, the national voter may rely on that and use it against the party. Mm. So normally it is very important that you learn how to, you know, even unite, you know, going into an election, an internal election, before, you know, you even hit the ground. And so um, I think that NDC has come a long way with this, and I, I, I commend them for that. Um, the second issue about, um, you know, strategy is, was also prominent in, 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 in their election. I mean, you know, 
Um, because of my background, I believe in political relationships, relationship between candidates and voters, relationship between um, political parties and voters, relationship between you know, members of a political party, very, very important. And if you know how to micromanage these things, you know, it always pulls some kind of crowd, you know, uh, for you. And I think that, you know, when you check, we were talking about the issue about Fifi Kwete, for the fact that, you know, he went um, into hibernation and we were not hearing of him and that kind of stuff. I think that he had a plan. And so when he stepped down from his constituency not to contest, he knew that he would one day go for the general secretaryship position. So he started working his way out. And so, you see, I, on Saturday, I was on one um, media station um, doing the analysis. And it was interesting, the comments that people were making and projecting a straight fight between Fifi Kwete and the... Uh, Elvis Efriyangra. Elvis Efriyangra. Right. You know, but I said, no, they should watch out for Otokuno. Why? Because I felt that the relationship could work for him. The relationship capital that he has built would work for him. And, and we saw a bit of that. So Fifi won, but Otokuno came in uh, second exactly. before exactly. Elvis Efriyangra. You know, even at a point in time, Otokuno was leading. Right. And people thought he was going to make it. Mm. All right. So you realize that what worked for him was that kind of um, relational thing that he also had established with the grassroots. And so I think that strategies, um, messaging, and other stuff, you know, play a key role in determining, you know, um, uh, victories in, 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 in political campaigns. Mm. So to wrap the conversation, gentlemen, a minute each so we can wrap. Looking at the crop of leaders, Johnson S. Yedun at the helm of affairs, First Vice, um, I would do Safo Azoka, Dr. Sherry Aite, who has served as minister before in there. Then we have Abanga Yakubu Al Hassan, whose brother, interestingly, you know, is in the MPP and contested, you know, during their last uh, Congress. Fifi Kwete. Then we have Barbara, with whom I just spoke. Joseph Yamin, national organizer. Sami Jemfi retained. Godwin Akogan, Malik Basentale, in fact, the substantive, and then Godwin Akogan. Uh, among others, also a deputy communication officer and youth organizer, Giorgio Pariado. What is the picture when you look at these leaders of the NDC going into election 2024? What do you see in a minute? And that question is for all of you gentlemen. That's how we wrap the conversation. So I'll quickly just focus on two of them, uh, Mr. Sami Jainfi, because these two are the ones that I follow their work very closely. Right. So Mr. Sami Jainfi, young, extremely passionate about the party, very articulate, very on top of the issues. So he definitely does bring that, um, those qualities, you know, to the party and mm. to the, you know, uh, to the group that has been uh, elected to serve the party. And then of course, there's General Mosquito, right? Mr. S.A. Dunketia, who has seen it all. He's been there when they've lost, he's been there when they've won. He's seen them through their best days. He's seen them through some of their not so best days. days. And right. so I think he also brings that rich party history experience, uh, groundwork, um, you know, all of that to bring to bear upon um, uh, what they have to do between now and 2024. So I think they have put together um, a group, but like I said, the two that are most familiar with their work are real assets to the party and I believe um, can bring a lot, you know, uh, to this leadership group that they've put together as they prepare for 2024. For you, uh, Dr. Kwame Asante. If you look at um, the, the people who have been elected, um, there's one thing that is common to all of them. <clears throat> their desire to win the next election. That is the driving force. And that is the pivot around which all of them are going to revolve um, their activities. The other issue is that if you look at them carefully, they are people of strategy. Um, uh, the rest of them, they always believe in strategy. And that is something that will uh, change the tide for them if they are able to put them together effectively. The issue of uh, all of them also having something to do with the rank and file. All right. They believe in the grassroots. That is where the votes are. 
And if you look at Sidun uh, Ketia, Fifi Kwete, the rest of them, they are always in touch with the grassroots. And for me, that is a spirit that is going to behind this, uh, this machine, electoral machine that they put together now for the battle 2024. Uh, the last of all the issues that I want to touch on is their organizational skills. If you look at them, they all have under their sleeves organizational skills. Even those who have lost, a free anchor, for instance, if you look at his, man, uh, his statement that he made, all based on his rich experience and then his organizational skills. I can't take away from all of them, the mean and all that they have. And above all, the, the ability to articulate their messages clearly. And the Sami Jemfi and all of them have all these things. I believe that they have all the, a good make. Uh, the important thing is how they organize things for an effect. And I believe that as they now begin uh, leaders of the party, they will begin to reflect on all these things and put them together, having at the back of their minds that they need data and feel frequently touch on that they will, he will serve the people with data that is necessary for them to win the battle of 2024. Thank you for uh, those thoughts. I'll, I'll wrap with you, uh, Dr. Tutu Brian. All right, so um, for me, um, the most important thing is not about you know the people that they have elected but the most important thing is how these people can coordinate and work together um, strategy is strategy and you don't go into um, electoral competition uh, without looking at you know strategy but strategy should be linked you know to 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 your cohort to your constituents and to your targets and so depending on who you are targeting, you formulate a strategy, you know, to reach out to them. And I also believe that one of the key things, you know, which strategy talks about these days, you know, has to do with the youth and, 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 and how you can attract them. Because the youth these days, you know, when it comes to political interest, you know, it is slowing down amongst them because um, of the fact that they don't really, you know, um, understand certain things in politics and what politicians are doing. So if your strategy will target them and then um, reach out to them and then you get them behind you to work. But unity is important in all these things. And I would probably want to um, recommend to the party um, and to all those who won and those who didn't win, you know, to come together. I mean, um, Temo Fusampofu had had experiences with this position and whatever it is, he can't say that he is going to um, sleep because he was not elected or he's not the man in charge. Um, again, my good friend Otokuno also cannot say that, you know, um, because I was not elected, you know, so I'm not going in there. And whoever, all those people, this is the time that if um, NDC is focusing on 2024 and winning the 2024 election. I mean, they need to come together and work as a team. Mm. And of course, we saw that statement from Ofuswampo for himself, uh, complaining about some things that happened, but also saying that it was a time to come together as a party and putting himself at the service of the party. Gentlemen, uh, we are grateful that you could join us for this conversation in the studio. Dr. Bernard Tutubwahim, lecturer, political marketing consultant with the University of Education, Winneba. Dr. Osai Kwapong, our old friend, a CDD fellow. Thank you uh, so much. And joining us via uh, Zoom, we had Dr. Kwame Asasante, political science lecturer, I should say, and uh, head of the Center for European Studies at the University of Ghana. We also had joining the conversation Barbara Sewa Samwa, Deputy General Secretary, elect, or at least now sworn in, of the party. Thank you all, gentlemen, for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, having uh, exhausted that first leg of the conversation, we get ready for the second uh, leg of the conversation, which has to do with the Burkina Faso escalation, the arm pass between Ghana and Burkina Faso. Now, the, the, the Burkinabe ambassador to Ghana has been withdrawn. And these are turbulent international waters that we seem to be swimming against the current. 
But what is going to happen, especially as our president has accused them of using mercenaries from the Wagner Group in Burkina Faso? Is this going to lead to some sort of escalation? And was it responsible or reprehensible on the part of our president to go down that road? More on that after the break.